Welcome to A Pod Full of Saints on Wednesday, the 22nd of February 2023, uh, episode 29, series four. They're breaking all sorts of records. Uh, we've got a glorious four days of the Saints between last Saturday and Tuesday to look back on, in which uh, we enhanced our promotion playoff push with one point and one goal from oh, two games. <laughs> oh, well, that'd be myself, David Tavner, and um, in the control room, Jay Kellicott. Hello, Dave. Hello, Lee. Hello, everyone. Um, and we'll try not to be too miserable as compared to Dave's introduction. It's not the end of the world. And in the d- design centre, we have uh, Lee Wood. It's good to see you in jovial mood today, David, and that you've set the tone nice and early for that positivity. Yeah. Well, it was a crack- cracking game last night. We'll come to that one in a minute. We'll start with an almost cracking game uh, last Saturday down in Weymouth, following on from the long trips to... Where have we been? Uh, Weymouth, and that Worthing. one Worthing, Hungerford. Uh, we went to Weymouth, and nil-nil. Long way to go for no goals. But I thought, Jake, uh, the first half was quite entertaining. It was certainly open, and it was quite fast, a bit frantic maybe. Um, and it looked like there was going to be some goals, but it gradually fizzled out. Yeah, it wasn't really worth the eight hours of travelling uh, <laughs> via the train <laughs> network. <laughs> but no, you're right. You know, it, it, that first half especially, I thought we played pretty well. Weymouth played pretty well. It was a fairly open game, pretty entertaining. We had some reasonable half chances, some good openings. You had a goal off for offside that I think, Dave, you've spoken about it elsewhere that very tight it looked. Um and then just something that half time seemed to change, didn't it? I mean, I don't, I don't think it was necessarily Weymouth. It felt like it was more our approach because Weymouth second half didn't create a lot of chances. It just felt like they were more on the front foot. Um, they just managed to take a little bit of control. So yeah, not quite, but you know, a point on the board. But again, you could see how genuinely annoyed Nobby was in his post match. Yeah, that, that second half performance made no sense at all. We'd... We got hammered at Hungerford, the bottom side, uh, what, less than two weeks earlier. So against the Weymouth, we're bottom but one, bottom two, whatever they were. Um, we, we've got to make amends for that and get a win there. And we didn't get a goal in either of those games. But that said, yeah, that offside goal for Sean Jeffers, the more I've watched it, um, it doesn't look offside to me. It was very tight. You can understand why the, ref, why the linesman has given it. But um, I don't know what you two think looking at the highlights. I, th- I thought it was pretty tight, but you know, it, it's not comparable to the game to Weymouth or to Hungerford. No, you're not doing that because we were much better, weren't we, first half? So I think that was the annoying thing was how yeah. we just totally seemed to switch off second half. And I went into half time thinking, hey, we haven't scored, but we've got a decent chance of winning this if we keep playing like we have been. Um, and then second half, it was almost like we just played for a point, didn't it? But then I, I, I don't know what happened. And, you know, we could say <laughs> we were lucky to get away with a point in the end as well. Yeah, the penalty they got. It's funny, the linesman who disallowed Sean Jeffers' goal, and he's had a few good goals ruled out this season, on top of the 22 he has scored. And the linesman who disallowed that goal, he's the one that gave the penalty, I believe. Um, the foul was clearly outside the area, if there was a foul at all. Um, it looks very dubious whether there's any serious contact. Indeed, but then I don't know if uh, they should have had a penalty for a handball earlier on in the game against uh, a certain Devontae Stanley. Uh, so I don't know if that balanced it out, but luckily we had um, Michael Johnson in goal, which was a bit of a surprise. It's funny, isn't it? Uh, uh, Dylan Berry was injured, broke a finger, which is the same reason why uh, uh, Michael Johnson's been out of the side for, what, 18 games. Um, so no one said he wouldn't let Dylan play. So in comes MJ. Fortunately, he's fit again. Hasn't had a game for the reserves or anything, I don't think, because uh, they got called off last week. And you're, you're wondering how he's going to do, because he's replacing Dylan Berry, who we're all highly impressed with. We know how good MJ is. And he comes straight back in. He saves the penalty. Last five penalties he's faced. He's only conceded one goal. Um, he came back in just the right time. Yeah, Lee, we were talking about before yesterday, weren't we? You know... Michael Johnson, he's still a very good keeper at this level. You know, Dylan Berry is impressed, of course, but Michael Johnson isn't a bad sort of number one to come back in, is he, when your other loney is out of the team? No, not at all. I mean, it's quite evident that MJ is still one of the best keepers in the division, really, on his day. And I think we've just been spoiled rotten by having Mr. Berry in between the sticks for the last couple, uh, last few months. Um, but I think it's just testament of the fact that 
MJ's worked so hard. We can we can see how hard he's worked to get back to full fitness, um, which was a surprise because, I mean, the the planets aligned because the the one week where Dylan Berry breaks his finger, MJ suddenly fit and raring to go, and not only raring to go, but but you know pulled off uh, a good performance to to get us a point. Um, second half, I thought we looked quite leggy. Um, I don't know whether. Nobby's reaction to the Worthing game was playing on the minds of the players. You know, maybe they sort of tightened it up a little tiny bit, but I mean, I wasn't there, so I can only sort of go off what what Mr. Ellicott and Co have been saying, and obviously the highlights as well. But um, disappointing, not 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 to come away from 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 there with all three points. But I, I guess, given the circumstances, a point will have to do. Yeah, we can't change it now. We will have to do. Yeah. Um, but we, as I said earlier, we look at those two games, Hungerford and Weymouth. Out, out of the last four games, we have a two. We thought, well, we get six points from those two. We've got to get six points from those two. And if we get anything from Worthing and Ebbsfleet, we'll draw one of those, maybe both of them. It wouldn't be a bad run. Instead, it just didn't work like that, did it? If it weren't for the Worthing game, um, it would have been a pretty poor run. And uh, we've got to bounce back. Yeah, I think you've just got to hope we don't regret these games come the end of the season, isn't it? That's the main thing. Um, I suppose another talking point from Saturday that leads into Tuesday's game was Sean Jeffers was pulled off with, what, 15, 20 minutes to go, wasn't he, Dave? Which is a bit of a surprise. Yeah. Um, ben McConnell featured a little bit as well. Um, but I think Jeffers coming off with the amount of time that was left, I think certainly behind the goal raised a few eyebrows. It's not the first time, is it? And, and of course, he got dropped early this season as well. Um, it's, it's almost like a kick up the backside is what we're trying to give him but we come on to him being dropped against Ebsley in the second um, when Glenn McConnell come on um, we'd gone completely flat by then but I thought he added mm. something to didn't he Jake but he just couldn't get us going around him we, we, we'd lost our way up front well and midfield by then as well yeah I, I'd like to have seen him get a bit more time on the pitch to be honest I think you know we know he's got that quality I think that's the only disappointment over the last month or so of course, the factor is, of course, his run in the FA Youth Cup with Cambridge. And we don't know if there's any restrictions on game time because of that. Uh, totally understandable from Cambridge's point of view. But I think the only thing over the last month or so, as, as well as we've played at times, I would have liked Glenn to feature a little bit more. Um, we've seen the impact that Shea Cooper's been able to have. And I think Glenn could have something similar if he gets a bit more time on the pitch. Yeah, Shea certainly looks useful. And, and Glenn is even better. He's the better of the two, I would say. But uh, two good loan signings, that's for sure. What did you make of the ground, Jay? It's a, it's a fine ground, isn't it? It's a great stadium. But my goodness, doesn't it need sprucing up a bit? Yeah, but I I, I kind of like that in a way. <laughs> you know, it's it's so old worldy. It's it's absolutely brilliant. It's always been a great ground to go to. Um, not sure about the ticketing ticketing uh, situation. That was that was a bit of a pain in the backside. But great ground, very welcoming supporters, nice clubhouse as well. Um, the only problem was was the performance. But yeah. You know that ground is one one of the easily one of the best grounds in the division up there of Clarence Park and and Twerton Park as well. I think Clarence Park used to be nice. All right. Oh um, dear me. Right, we move on to Tuesday then. Uh, we had the surprise with Michael Johnson coming in for Dylan mm. Berry on Saturday. Bigger surprise last night at Clarence Park. Sean Jeffers dropped. Um, David Noble obviously did try to do the kick up the backside. And he brought in Joe Neal. Now, we all like Joe Neal, and hopefully he's going to be a good player. A goal scorer is what he is not. He had two in 48 games before last night. Sean had got more goals against Ebsley <laughs> alone, <laughs> let alone all the others he scored as well. What was it, 67 in 104 games before last night? To me, it looked at best a risky decision, almost certainly a wrong decision. What did you two make that? Yeah. It was brave. It was brave, wasn't yeah. it? You know, we when when we saw the lineup, we thought, "What is going on?" I mean, the fact is that we're playing the league leaders, and we seem to bind off our top scorer onto the bench. Um, I I've got full trust in Nobby because he he obviously speaks to the players and he is aware of the situation and he knows how to man manage the individuals. I thought it was brave. Did it come off? Not for me. Um, as you say, let's talk. Let's 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 address the elephant in the room. Joe Neal. 
good player, you know, lots of energy, lots of heart, lots of gusto. Um, I think Cooper is where we thought Joe Neal would be in terms of the goals and stuff and the quality he brings to the table. I mean, to be fair, looking at Nobby and the team that he's acquired now, I thought last night was, I mean, it was it was the best chance we've had of beating Ebsfleet um, than any, anything we had under Ian. I think the players have got the quality of, of, of players there. Um, but Joe Neal, his decision-making was poor last night. I have to say, yes, he put himself around and he ran himself in into the ground and you can see all the attributes that he's got. But I think if you have Jeffers there, I think there's something, you know, there's a couple of opportunities where he he got to the byline and he could have pulled back a couple of times um, for oncoming Saints players to sort of tap in or score goals. But he went for the shot, he went for the glory. Uh, it was selfish, it was unnecessary. And he even apologised to, you, especially the one in the second half, Jake, he actually put his hand up and apologised. You had three players in the box. And I think that's where now you need to address the situation. You know, we've got a problem like Joe Neal where no one's going to doubt, you know, his, his, what he's got in the tank to give us. And I know we had some comments last night, Jake, you know, a friend of ours said, oh, he's really young and he could be taught to do that. Well, that's fine. But I've seen younger, younger players do better um, at, 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 at Clarence Park. How many, how, how many opportunities do you want to give Joe Neal, really? Would you make it, uh, Jake? Would you have made that brave decision, as, as Lee rightly called it? No, I mean, there's a, there's a group of us in the pub beforehand, shocker. Um, and when we all saw that team, we thought, oh, no, this is going to be a long old night. And to be fair to the lads and the, the players, and we'll get into it a bit more detail, they totally surpassed all our expectations and put in a brilliant performance, and we'll get onto that. But Joe Neal, I think, for me, first half, the plan somewhat worked you know we he did stretch the game a little bit he did create a lot of space there was a lot of movement the pressing sort of worked but towards the end of that first half he had a couple of chances where he could have crossed really drilled in crosses every time it was almost just a weak pass almost cleared every time and then second half early on that one lee that i think nobby mentions in his interview as well goes for goal from a ridiculous angle probably the first time all night when he had other opportunities where he could have actually shot and he didn't goes for the one that he shouldn't have um, when there were players queuing up at the back post. So I think after that, I think, you know, again, I would have brought on Sean Jeffers earlier. Um, but for me, I'd have start, started with Sean anyway against a team like Ebsley. And you saw throughout the first half, they had two men on Joe Neal every time and they would just blow him out the water in that regard. So I thought Joe did OK and I thought the plan worked first half. But for me, I, you know, Jeffers, I'd have brought him on at half time um, and really changed that. So... I could see why Nobby was thinking about it, but at the end of the day, at this point of the season, it's all about results. We, we didn't get the result. Well, a lot of it is down to confidence, though, isn't it? And yeah. he's empty in terms of that. Um, he was almost sort of getting in the way um, in the first half. He didn't know really where to sort of run. He, I mean, nine times out of ten, he was running in the right channels and he was doing the right things. Playing up front is a pretty thankless task at the best of, best of times. Um, mm. But I think when... When you've got the players that Epsi have got, when the ball is coming up to Joe Neal, that's got to stick. It's got to stick. He's got to buy time to let the runners come on. And that wasn't happening. Um, and I think the midfield were getting overrun. And you could see the situation. Epsi had a couple of gears in them. You could see it. All they had to sort of do was flick that switch and away they went. <laughs> and they did it a couple of times in the first half in particular. But when you, when you know that their players are such a high calibre, You've got to take take that out of the game. I mean, when the ball is played up to you, it's got to stick. Um, and Jeffers, Jeffers does that well. And that's why that's probably another additional feather as to why I didn't really realise why Joe started. Another player from the Weymouth game who didn't feature last night was uh, Ricardo Di Solio. Do, do anyone know why he wasn't even in the squad? He wasn't even on the bench. No, no idea. But they're too fair. I thought the defence did fairly well, actually, last night against a team that yeah. scored six on Saturday. Um, so, again, I, in, the game, in the pub forehand, we were quite worried about the defence and no Trollio, but fair play, I thought he stepped up. Um, the replacements that came in stepped up and did really well. But, you know, if there is an injury for Trollio, that is, of course, a concern because he's been in good form recently. I think on Jeffers, you know, before we move on, it was interesting to note as well, 
the reaction from the younger supporters when he came on as well, or when we saw him getting ready. You know, a lot of the f- fans very vocal and very clear. You know what they wanted. They wanted him on as soon as possible. So you know, Nob- Nobby, he's learning the ropes. We we say that every week at the minute, um, and I think it's great that he feels like he's got that confidence to be able to drop him. But you know, there's a lot of learning from last night. I think again, even against a very good team like Ebbsfleet. So the one thing yeah, that, that I would say. Sorry, before before we sort of do skip on, there were uh, uh, quite a few shouts, Jake, that we noticed of discontent towards Joe Neal. And, mm. and I, I didn't think were warranted that much. I mean, it, it wasn't his best game, but I think that, that it needs to be managed well now, the situation. Um, I think because the crowd wasn't, I'm pretty sure, wasn't what the club expected at last night. It was pretty down on what they wanted. So to have a couple of sort of comments, quite derogatory comments from behind the goal. Um, I think that, that situation has to be looked at and be managed well. I mean, it didn't hear him from a side of the pitch, Lee. Um, so hopefully Joe didn't get him as well, but it, it's a shame to hear that against their own players. But yeah, there we go. Um, right, on to the match. What a cracking game. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Forget the team, the actual team that went out there in the end. It was a cracking game. We got off to a great start. Shea almost scored in the first few minutes. He did score after six. Kyron Wiltshire, we talked about this at half time, Lee. That fantastic drive from him from the side of the pitch. He looked certain goal. I think even behind the goal, you thought it was going in, didn't you? I mean, he absolutely spanked it. I, and it, I mean, when he put it down, it sat up so nicely for him. And when he struck it, we're like, oh my word! I think we even held hands at one point, Jake, because I thought we were sort of going into the top corner. You, you certainly grabbed me. Yes. Um, <laughs> there's no charge for that, mate. That that one is free. But that was it. Was for all intents and purposes going into that top corner tabs, and I was just waiting for that stanchion to thud. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Cooper's goal was exceptionally taken. I mean, for for someone so young to have that quality on the ball twisted and turned. He was always the outlet. He was always the spare man. He was always available to receive the ball. The start was amazing. I mean, one thing I would say is I put on my socials that the players gave it their all. They left everything on that Clance Park pitch and I am exceptionally proud of the performance that that the lads put in. And yes, Ebsley are the best team that we will have down at Clance Park this season. And although they did step up in gears, I don't think we let it get away from us, which I think was really important. I think I was chatting to another fan on the way down to the ground. He goes, what, what, what do you want from tonight, Lee? So to be honest with you, I want to be competitive. you know. And I think if we can stop them from scoring early, I think we're in with a chance because they always seem to score early against us. Um, but I think the display the lads put last night was absolutely astonishing and they should be a, they are a credit to the club because they, they put in a damn good shift last night and once they once Ebsfleet went ahead we could have just capitulated but we didn't we, we stuck in there we had a game plan and it almost there was that thing where they just flipped a switch and off and off they went it was almost as though it was in like FIFA mode you know there was one touch stuff going on but the lad stuck at it and uh, Jake mentioned beforehand the defence was superb uh, yeah, there were a couple of last ditch tackles and you know diving headers and, and, and all of that. But you expect that against a side of the quality of Ebbsfleet. Um, their manager was very, very complimentary about us, and rightly so. Outstanding performance, boys, and uh, you are credit to our team. We talked about uh, Wiltshire's shot there. What about in the second half, Jake? That one from Manash Sundar from the side oh. of the pitch. He, he couldn't have hit it harder. Keeper did well to save it. I thought Mitch was going to get the rebound, but they managed to block that as well. From where you were, did you think it was going in? Yeah, absolutely. And I have to say, Cousins, you know, he's a very good keeper. Uh, yeah. Most of those absolute players are very good players. A lot of them could still be playing in the Football League, if we're frankly honest, if you look at their histories. Um, and he made some very good saves. He made the save from Cooper inside the first minute. Manash, um, Mitchells as well. Yeah, that was a brilliant double save, that one. Um, yeah. And, you know, out of the two keepers, you know, he's the one that made the far more spectacular ones last night. Um, but it was, ni- it was nice to see us actually taking a few speculative shots that almost went in. You know, so often, especially at Weymouth, around the edge of the box, a bit tippy-tappy again and sort of not getting shots away. It was good to see it last night. 
And yeah, just so, so unlucky. I think Banton had another one that was deflected just over the bar. It was so, so unlucky. Um, but yeah, such a great performance. It was. It was great to see us attacking a side like that, which we did at the early stages. And we really hammered them in the closing stages as well. And we just couldn't get the break that we needed. That sort of performance gives you a lot of hope. <laughs> uh, total reverse of a second half Saturday. And somehow, Nobby's got to build them together. You hope we're not becoming big time Charlies. We played well against Epley, played well at Worthing. We were flat against Weymouth most of the game. And uh, Hungerford, we've got to pick ourselves up for the little games, not just the big ones. Absolutely. We have, but don't forget that. Sorry, Jay, go on. No, 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 you go ahead, mate. I'm just, just, just going to say because they give us so much time on the ball. You know, Epsley mm. came to play football. Worthing came to play football. It's when you get the teams that are fighting for their survival. You know, they want to leave a little bit on our players. And, and sometimes we don't get as much time, uh, you know, to put our plan into place. Uh, but that's that's what the, that, that's what training is there for. That's what David Noble is there for. Sort of try and, as, as you say, Tavs, amalgamate the good performances with the bad ones. So that when the games do come where we expected to get three points... Be a bit more ruthless and maybe have that bit more quality in the final third as well. It is right they came to play football because they're a good side. They're an excellent side and yeah. Yeah, probably yeah. the most expensive in the division, but we don't know the figures, but just assume that. But Chris Solly on Sean Jeffers in the second half from the other side of the pitch did one of the worst lunges at a player I've ever seen. He looked absolutely shocking. I don't know what it's going to come up like on the uh, highlights, but mm. from where you were, did it, did it look just as bad? And how it didn't get a red card, I don't know. It wasn't the only one like that as well. But yeah, that was a terrible one. And, you know, Chris Solly is an experienced football league player. He knew what he was doing. Absolutely. And last night, the game wasn't, you know, totally decided by the officials. But I thought it was one of the worst officiating performances I've seen at Clarence Park in a little while, actually. Uh, and it wasn't just the referee, the, the linesman as well, especially the one first half down the left-hand side. Uh, almost any contact that a Saints player made with a defender Oh, that's a foul! That's a foul. Sure. Was this the linesman that was sort of keeping up with play, or the other one? <laughs> and midway through the second half, Lee, there was, I think there was another challenge down the far end. It looked like the Saints got the ball. So there's a yellow card, and you just turn around. It's like, it, you know, it, he must be guessing. He can't be this bad. He just must be guessing. Well, there was that one on Blackman. He got smashed. Banton got smashed. You know, Jeffers was targeted quite rightly because you know that's what you do to your good players, but. I mean, there's cynical and then there's just like, you know, abuse. Um, and, I, and I thought the referee bottled a few big decisions when it came to the cards last night. Ryan Blackman, his booking, that's the best tackle he's put in since he joined us. <laughs> yeah. Got the ball, magnificent tackle. Oh, I'm booking you for that. It was ludicrous. And, and Andrew Humphreys, we'd had him eight times before. We quite like him. We won five of the games. Um, no real issues with him before. But yesterday, I thought he got his... Uh, you to imagine he got his cards completely wrong. Uh, I, I don't know what he was up to. It was bizarre. And I think as well, it wasn't just the fouls. It was the time wasting, absolutely kicking the ball away at every opportunity during yeah. the second half. Everything they can. Uh, a few times their players went down with a couple of knocks inside the last 20 minutes. Miraculously, they got up absolutely fine 10 seconds later every time. Referee wasn't interested in anything like that at all. Um, and just really, really poor. And I think it didn't decide the game. But when a game is that good, surely as a referee, you're thinking, I'm just going to enjoy it. Well, maybe that's what he was doing. He was enjoying it too much and not actually watching the fouls. Um, but, you know, it's just bizarre officiating for me. And I just, I think, annoyingly, I think first half as well, I think it set the tone for Epsleet for what they could get away with. Mm. And I think they exploited it throughout the game, sadly. That's a great point. Because the thing is, as you say, chances are most of those are league players. And they've been playing the game. They've got the experience. They've got like the you know the know how of how to sort of see a game out. How 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 to play the officials. I know Tavs is a he, he hates all that sort of time wasting stuff, but they did it to an absolute T because that's how they win titles. You know, it, it's that professionalism. It's just that another. It's another level of uh, intelligence when it sort of comes to playing the game of football. I guess. Also, winning nine games and drawing one of the last ten, that's, that's another good way to win a title, I think. It is. Well, yeah. It is, you're right. I was going to say that, you know, there's not many teams this season that will have absolute defending like they did in that last ten minutes, backs against the wall. There's not many teams at all that have them like that. Yeah, but also, how many, how many of those of those ten teams 
have put Epsley under that much pressure yeah. for that prolonged yeah. amount of time. You know, because when right. it's all well and good when when you get in the results and you're like two, three nil up or whatever it, it may be, but they were they had sort of the first fifteen minutes of the second half. The rest of rest of the second half, we were pushing them, and they knew they were in a game, and maybe they panicked a little bit, and they they thought, hang on a minute, how do we how do we get out of this one? And that's probably how, that's where the experience of those league players comes into it, you know, because they weren't they can't have too many results where they've come from behind like that um, and got a positive win as well. So I thought they defended superbly. Actually, I know we had those other efforts; we could have had more goals, yeah. but they defended. Really well, so um, full marks to them for that. I have to say that because I forgot what I was going to say. Well, I mean, that's what, what about their record now. Sorry, well, I know what I was going to say, I'll come on to it in a second, but it's 21 games against them now. The last 21 games, they've won <laughs> 18, we've won two. It's, a, it's an incredible statistic. Um, Mitchell Weiss was fit again, uh, he was only on the bench. I know we talked about uh, Joe Neal came in. <sighs> Mitch, should he have started? Um, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't think he had a massive impact on the game when he came on. To be honest, so I, I, I don't know. I think Mitch, you know, he's had a few knocks this season. I think you don't want to risk him, do you? Really, because you know, against a team like Epsley, he could have easily been cleared out in the first five minutes by an absolute defender with the way they some of their tackles, and that's him gone for another four games. You know, so I think I I can understand why Nobby did not want to rush Mitch back. To be honest, I thought that was an understandable decision. At no point in that first half was I looking at the game thinking if only Mitch was on. You know mm. what I mean? It, we were we were we were playing okay, we were creating chances. The shape was still there, even though Ebsley had a few breakaways down that left left hand side. But at no point did, did I, I think this is crying out for Mitch, as opposed to if Jeffers were to have come on a bit earlier, it, he could have made that impact a bit sooner. Um, but when he did come on, he slotted straight into the equation. He was still creating chances. He yeah. were, he looked sharp. He looked decent. Um, I thought Nobby, Nobby got the whole Mitch situation right yesterday. Yeah. It's ending on uh, Manash Sunday as the first substitute it was interesting because Manash hasn't been great of late. But uh, yeah, I thought he did all right when he came on last night and uh, hopefully that gave him a bit of confidence to, to grow back into the player uh, we had before. Um <laughs> Right, there we go. Shame since he's Shane Banton score. He's still waiting for his 50th goal for the club. But it can't be too far away. No, but, no, wait, no yeah, not so I thought. Again, oh. Zane really impressed me again, I thought. Yeah. You know, him and him and Shea Cooper and Tafari Moore, they had some really brilliant link up play at times. Um just really good. Zane's so reliable, isn't he? Every every almost every week. It seemed to me though that they they did struggle with the pitch. Especially in the second half, down the right hand side, they yeah. they, you know, normally the interactions are quite sort of free flowing. They're sharp, they're crisp. The movement is good. I think Tafari Moore in particular had a, had a few troubles sort of turning on because it, it it was quite sandy, wasn't it, in the corners. I know they probably had some problems there in terms of drainage or whatever, but um, they did struggle, and I'm not saying that hampered them to the degree where they couldn't perform well because they obviously did, but it would just be Interesting to find out how that affects us going forward over the course of time as well. well that pitch was very sandy, Lee. You're, you're dead right. And also, it was so bobbly. I mean, you saw it several times. A player, mm. the ball was going to him, suddenly go whoop. And it led to one Ed Fleet player running the ball out of play because it just bounced up. His leg or went through mm. his leg or whatever. And um, that's not good. We've uh, still quite a bit of a season to go. Uh, you do worry about what could happen to the pitch the rest of the season. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't say I, I ever remember there being that much sand on Clarence Park, apart from the playground around the corner. Um, it, was, yeah, it, was, it was unbelievable, wasn't it? You know, literally first five minutes, the ball bounced and sand just went everywhere. And I was like, oh, my yeah. God, what's happened here? Um, I say, I think, I think the disappointing thing as well, I say, Tafari Moore, you know, we've praised Devontae Stanley in recent weeks, but Tafari Moore is equally as impressive recently. But at Clarence Park, he's struggling. And that's because he's being forced to play on that side, especially f second half. And he's just not getting any luck. You know, a few weeks ago, he was slipping over in the puddles. Now he's getting stranded in the sand. So, you know, it, he's, he's not had much luck on that side, has he? So hopefully for him, things improve soon. Stranded in the sand. How long have you been working on that, Jake? It was instantaneous, Dave. Yes, yes. 
also a bit of credit. We haven't really named them the defenders. Um, Callum Adebay, something's passed in the second half. It was a bit funny. Uh, Michael Clark and Joy McKenna. I thought they all worked really hard last night against a quality attack. And just that eight minutes spell with two goals undone them in the end. Excellent. They were strong. They were strong in the air. They were strong in the tackle. They weren't flustered. They were composed. Even when Ebbsfleet went on their rampage at the start of the second half, they were still composed. They still played football. Two feet out from the back and they used the men really, really, really well. And they put their bodies on the line. And uh, as a unit, they're playing exceptionally. Um, the Worthing game notwithstanding, but I think on the whole, defensively, mm -hmm. those three last night, superb. Yeah, I, th I thought it was important for Michael Clark, especially, you know, at Worthing, pulled off at half-time. Last two games, though, improved. He looked better. And I thought last night as well, Clark, a bit of the Clark of old, you know, marching out of defence a little bit, bit more confidence on the ball, really good to see. And you also have to throw in, you know, last three, four months, they've been playing with a different goalkeeper behind them. So Michael Johnson's come back in, and, you know, the defence looks good, even with MJ coming back in. Of course, they know him, but it always takes time to adjust between, you know, what keepers want from you. So, really, really good. Good. What about the attendance? 1,108. Um, considering the gates we've had last season and this season, I think most people would have expected a heck of a lot more than that. Any idea why not? We've had some correspondence, haven't we, Jacob? Yes, it was from Andy, wasn't it, Lee? It was Andy Thomas, yes. So, uh, have you got the tweet there, or do you want me to read it out? Oh, I'll, I'll find it. Hold on. Look how prepared we are. Right, I'll put it up. <laughs> so, Andy Thomas tweeted us at the Podfiller Saints and asked, "What's the low attendance last night?" Sleep had a fairly decent contingent there. A reflection of the current demographic in the fan base of local families with children and academy children, distorting the numbers on a Saturday. It's quite a bit of truth in that, you would have thought, wouldn't you? Um, number of kids probably was down last night. Of course, a lot of those don't pay to get in. All right, they come with an adult who pays to get in. So it, it's a false figure in some respects because uh, all the freebies have been included as well. Um, but yes, without those, uh, as Andy says, it does hit the uh, figure. I think we explained this, didn't we? We were chatting about this last night, Jake. You get a rough idea we've been going long enough to sort of know how many numbers roughly are in. And I think actually someone behind us said it 1100. Um, Cause you can still walk through the cola stand. The, there was seats still available in the main stand. You can still walk behind the goal relatively comfortably. I thought there'd be more. I really did don't think that there'd be more. And I think the club would be shocked as into how low it was. Um, but, but, but look, I mean, the 1,106 that were there were treated to an absolute feast of football. Um, and they'll be talking about that all day today. You can absolutely bet you at, this, at schools and work, etc. cetera. Um, yes, there are academies and there are children that do get in for free. But as you say, Tavs, you know, they've got to come with a paying adult. It's just, I don't know what more you have to do when you've got the league leaders in town. On the whole, we're still, all right, results aside for the last few, few games, we're still playing relatively attractive football. I'm not entirely sure what else you've got to do to attract people back to Clarence Park. But I will say this. I will tell you the exact same thing we've been harping on about for years. St. Albans City is always a fluctuation of fans. It always has. You, you get your 800 hardcore and then the rest of it is just dependent. You know, you, you can't sit there and rely on 1,600 people coming to the game every single week because that doesn't happen. You know, it's just the logistics and the locality of where we are, um, circumstance as well. And that's that's what it is. But I think it's still a good crowd, Tavs. Do you know what I think? Yeah. 1,100 to come for a Tuesday night? Well, the funny thing is, you go back pre-COVID, crowds of 1,100 down the park, we'd, we'd jumped at it. We'd have been full of play, uh, joy and whatnot. Yeah, but it's down on last season. Of course, that's what it is now measured against. But but in the past, that gate like that, where we had it in the conference national season two twenty two thousand six seven. Uh, beyond that, rest of my life, no. <laughs> it, it's, it's something we we should be enjoying. But of course, it's concerned because it is down on last season. It shows how far we've come, doesn't it? But yeah, just this this point in the game wasn't on a Saturday because I know you know I wonder if the crowd. How much better it, it would have I been. I don't know, but... mate. I mean, 
the old girl underneath those lights, you know, the sort of... Oh, yeah. It, it's... If you can't get excited for games like that, then don't bother coming <laughs> because, you know, it's such a... It's a recipe, isn't it, for an excellent day of football. So, but still, there we go. Yeah, the average this season now for league games, uh, 1,191 as opposed to 1,321 last season. But the mm. last oh. full season before COVID, 2018-19, uh, was that a full season? It is now, who cares? Um, <laughs> probably wasn't. Uh, 842. Was. So, you know, we've got to be grateful for what we're getting. And uh, yeah. make, sure we don't, make sure we don't keep losing it. Massive yeah. jump. I'm actually surprised that how much, le- well, how much less. It's not a lot less, but compared to last season, actually, that's that's genuinely surprised me. Mm-hmm. Didn't realise that. So, work to do. Hopefully, you know, next few weeks, a few home games on Saturdays might pull a few more people back in again. Yeah. Yeah. Right, this coming Saturday, Slough Town at Clarence Park. Uh, last nine Slough. games, one beaten against them. I think we've won seven. Um, there's, oh, they've lost their last three after a, a very small recovery because they've been on downward slide all season. Lost the last three without scoring. They've got Johnny Goddard, former Saint. They've got Elliot Bennion going back even further, former Saint. Uh, any changes you'd predict for the City lineup? You'd imagine Jeffers comes in for Joe Neal. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate. I'm just assuming that is going to happen. Do we know what the situation is with McConnell? Can he, can he, he play after playing in the Cup to Cambridge or? I think well, he can do. Be it's going to be up to Cambridge, isn't it? Yeah. 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 I mean, it doesn't help. They're playing Thursday instead of Wednesday, but there you go. I think he probably starts on the, I think he's, he's on the bench for us. I would, I would keep Cooper. I think he's done nothing to suggest that he needs to be swapped for any, anyone else. Uh, I think apart from that, as you were, you know, because the lad, the only thing you would sort of say Someone's bound to have a knocks, you know, a few niggles and knocks from from last night. But apart from that, if everyone is fit, you only have the the straight swap for uh, Jeffers and Joe Neal. It's going to be interesting to see Johnny Goddard back down the park. Um, yeah. I thought he had a good game when we played at Arbour Park earlier this season. Mm. Yes, he did. Um, him and Benyon both started last night against Dartford. Um, so... We'll see. Yeah, same for me in terms of the team. Got to bring Jeffers back in. Got to keep Cooper in the team, haven't you? Um, I'd like to see. I'd like to see Cooper, Jeffers, and Banton have a game together where we're actually looking quite good going forward. Because you know they haven't really had that from the start of a game. Only really Worthing second half was that. So I'd like to see that uh, midfield. Hopefully Blackman's okay. He took quite a, a, a strong knock, didn't he, midway through the second half, but seemed to play through it at the end. Um, and of course, what Wiltshire got? What fifteen, twenty minutes of rest? Bit rare for him. So <laughs> hopefully he'll be back in. Well, I suppose question over to Trollio as well, isn't it? I think Wiltshire is, is carrying injury, isn't he? He went off in the last minute at Weymouth with yeah. an injury, and I suspect that flared up again last night because uh, he was doing a decent job in there. So they wouldn't have willingly taken him off. He'll, he'll he'll be a massive miss if he's if he's not available to start on Saturday. Whoever we're playing, you know, Wiltshire. He's sort of one of those unsung heroes in the centre of the team, isn't he, at the minute? The work he does that goes unnoticed, apart from putting shots just past the post that Lee would almost, you know, cried over. Um, you know, it's it, it, you know, apart from that, it's he's doing very good in the middle there. So he'd be a massive loss. Um and yeah, it'd be good to find out what's up with Detrolio, as we mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um but... right, any predictions for that one? Predictions. Well, we have some we have some friends coming over from our twin town in Vaughan. They're coming over. Uh, there's about oh. four or five of them coming over. So predictions is we are going to get extremely drunk uh, whilst trying to uh, enjoy the football. So that's one prediction. Second prediction is I reckon we're going to win quite comfortably on Saturday. Famous last words as they come back to haunt me. Um, I reckon I'm going to go for three one, three one Saints. It'd be a three one double, wouldn't it? Can you bet on that, Jake? Uh, I, no, <laughs> I actually don't know now. Um, I was going to get comfortable as well. Don't want to jinx it. Uh, I'll go two one Saints. But, <laughs> hey, yeah. but 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 you know, looking at that Slough team, there's still a couple of players that can hurt you in that. So they've they've had a bad run recently. 
the key is we got to play like we did against Epsley. If we can play like we did against them, you know, we won't have any issues. It's funny, isn't it? Going into the weekend, we were in a very nice position. Uh, and suddenly, here we are, we're outside the playoffs. So it's us playing catch up. So Slough, it's, it's got to be a three point win. It's got to be. But you said, though, Tabs, there's, there's still a lot of football to play, though, mate. I don't, I don't mm. think we've got to get twitchy just yet. No, no. We've got to take it game by game at the minute, haven't we? Um, and, you know, Slough, you've got to be looking, looking for maximum points there. Um, we know it's going to be difficult. And like we mentioned earlier, we know that there's a, there's a good likelihood that they'll probably sit in, won't they, and defend for a fair bit of the game. We've got to try and break them down. But if we want to make it into the playoffs, that's what we've got to do. Yeah. Of course, the point. They're under new management, aren't they, since we last went there. John Underwood and um, Neil Baker both went uh, earlier in the season. And now another one of our players, Scott Davis, has stepped up. Yes, uh, but it's think... interesting times at Slough at the moment. They've got some, a lot of issues there by the sound of it. <laughs> Yeah, I think they've got new owners now, or they've got at least an investment coming in. So hopefully they'll, right. they'll be okay. But you know, you know, Dave, did um did we uh equal last season's points tally on Saturday? You put that you put that in your notes, and I didn't actually believe it. Like, that's, that's yeah. some, I can't believe what happened last season. <laughs> well, it ju- just shows how we fell away in the second half of last season. In fact, this time last year we were in a run of five successive defeats, so we got time to. Uh, Push well ahead of that points total. It's, it's amazing how it fell away, isn't it? And you look at it now, we've, we've gone past, gone past, well, we'll be going past it very soon. It's amazing that more people came to watch us on, you know, how how bad yeah. we were to a second half of last season. Um, yeah. It was shocking. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> uh, it's, um, and as well, I think the, the, the most annoying thing is everyone else seems to be winning around us now, don't they, at the minute? Like oh, everyone. Um, I think. The points total to get into the playoffs this season is going to be really quite high. Um, so we're going to have to be at our best to do it because it's it's going to be a challenge. Mm. Well, our best didn't do us any good last night. Well, that's, that, well hey, hey, that's harsh. That's harsh. And also, <laughs> Ed Fleet, Ed, Ed Fleet's manager, Dennis Kutrib, says we're going to get promoted via the playoffs. So, I mean, you know, he, that's a guarantee, he, isn't it? He, he was very impressed, wasn't he? It seemed pretty genuine what he said in his post-match. Well, I think, like he said, there's not many part-time teams that go up against Ebbsfleet and give them a scare like that this season. Uh, and the consistent, yeah. and the, it, it, it was constant, wasn't it? It wasn't for like yeah. a spell of twenty minutes. This was pretty much for the whole game. You know, we we went toe to toe with the best team in the division. We caused them no end of problems. I don't think having a point off of them would have been wrong. You know, I don't think anyone would have argued if we come away with that with a point. So he's right. He's spot on. I I do like the cut of his jib, and I thought he was very respectful in when he sort of spoke about us because you don't always get that with op- opposition managers, do you? Um, but I think there's a foundation there now. What I would say is that as long as there's not an expectancy for us to play like that from every single game, because mm. that's just that's unsustainable. But I think just the performance level where we can win games, as Tav said like your Hungerfords and your Weymouths, you know, we, we need to start picking up points like that. You just need to like have a flat line of consistency, of quality as well, going out from between now and April. Dennis and Nobby had a long chat on the pitch before the game and uh, seemed very, um, well, respectful of each other, as you mentioned, that leads the right word. And uh, there's a mutual respect. Um, so hopefully Dennis will be right at what he said about us. That's where the respect okay. ends, because I think we're going to absolutely smash Slough on Saturday. So, uh, get yourself down ah. there. Oh, let's put no. This sort of, well, well, they don't care. They don't care about us. We don't care about them. Let's, let's, let's have it. So, I mean, come down. Let's just get involved. I mean, Lee, what time are you starting drinking on Saturday? I don't think you'll even know what's going on in the football, are you, by 3pm? Well, I'm meeting the Germans, I think, sort of Friday afternoon. So, that's that's when it's going to oh, start. No. Um, oh, no. If anyone is in the Farmer's Boy, about half past four in the morning, come and say hello. Come, come and buy me a drink. Um, Including Lee's wife, Mrs. That's... Wood. Hey, leave, leave her out of it. She's already a big fan of yours, obviously. So don't get her involved, mate, in all of this. But yes, uh, um, if you do come and see us, come and say hello. Which we've had a couple of people approach us randomly on the terraces of Planets Park the last few uh, games. Jacob is going to give you all our contact details right now. Yeah, emails in the description and at Pod Fuller Saints on Twitter. Um, and I suppose that's it for now, Dave. Do you have anything last minute you'd like to mention? No, good luck to Glenn McConnell on Thursday with Cambridge United. Uh, 
away to Arsenal, is it Highbury or wherever it is they play these days. <laughs> and on, on that note, uh, we will see you all again next week. Thank you very much, everyone. Hello, Terry.